Welcome to Porn Talk with Powerful Eric. End the porn habit. Reclaim your power. Here's your host, Powerful Eric. Welcome to Porn Talk. This is Powerful Eric. The purpose of this show is to help you end the porn habit and reclaim your power. But it's not just about breaking addictions, it's about breaking belief systems. We are bound by self-imposed and societal chains. Break the chains. Get empowered now. My guest today is Sandy Joy. Sandy is a registered psychotherapist with a master's degree in counseling psychology. She's a registered professional counselor and a master practitioner of clinical counseling. Sandy is a certified clinical traumatologist a qualified clinical counseling supervisor, and is proud to be a certified coach of the Mindful Habit System. Help me welcome my friend, Sandy Joy. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for inviting me today. Sure. Well, Sandy, can you tell the listening audience a little about yourself and how porn has affected your life? Absolutely. For several years, um, well, I'll just say D-Day was almost three years ago for me, and D-Day was discovery day that my my husband, and husband was having affairs. But for several years before that, um, you know, we're healthy adults, um, but intimacy was a was an issue. There was a lack of intimacy, and for I'm going to say almost ten years. And very little. It just kept dwindling and dwindling. And I thought, oh, as we were aging, my my um, now ex husband was on medication. Um, I thought, you know, the libido was was lower. You know, there was issues with erectile dysfunction. Um, we thought, okay, it's a normal part of aging. You know, weight, medical issues, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. However, even in the the two years or three years before I found out there was not even like hand holding. Like there was just no intimacy of any kind. And intimacy to me is a safeness. It's a, you know, the hand holding, the hugging, the just even cuddling. It doesn't have yeah. to be the actual sexual act. Right. Um, and so we were in marriage counseling and none of this came up. It was, there, there was other excuses. There was, you know, that he resented me for the time I did doing my schoolwork while I was getting my master's degree and, and um, I just kept saying, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Why don't you want me? And he said, I don't want any women. And I, and I, and I knew that wasn't true. And I would say to him, but I see you looking at other women. Mm-hmm. And, but you don't look at me that way. And I had taken to actually changing in the bathroom or changing in, in the closet, <clears throat> walk-in closet, because I felt incredibly self-conscious and invisible. Mm. That something was wrong with me that he didn't want me. Yeah. The day I found out, accidental, found out I had his phone because just his sister called and wanted to talk to me and called on his phone. And so I wasn't looking through his phone. I just went to hang it up. And at the same time, an email came through that um, was quite clearly from another woman and having an affair. So over the course of a few days, found out that actually he was had a porn addiction and a sex addiction. And my world... Being together with someone at that time of finding out was almost 34 years. And um, we, in, in all, we were married um, 31, lived together 33 and a half years. And my world turned completely upside down, thinking that I knew who I was with. To find out he had been actually living a double life for more than 10 years. And that it actually started when he was 14 years old with porn and porn addiction severe porn bondage um but how porn to that day had still was a daily thing for him and it it, it really it i was destroyed so not only was my trust shattered but my whole life my whole thought process my whole everything was shattered my whole belief system if you will was shattered yeah and and I years that's a long time. Long time, and a long time. Why do you think he went to therapy with you when he was like? What's the point of going to therapy if if he's going to continue to you know cheat on you and right? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. 
And it was because this, this addiction is so incredibly deep and dark and secretive. And it fosters and thrives in secrecy. Yes. Yes, it and does. And it does. And just, just to put a kind of an ad in, no secrets are good. <laughs> All secrets are harmful. Hmm. If you say, well, I'm keeping a secret because I've got something for their birthday. That's not a secret. That is a surprise. Yeah. And that's something completely different. Yeah. It is something that you're planning to, to be. It's a happy thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. Secrets, when we tell our children, or if a child, you know, going off topic a little bit maybe, if, if a child is told, don't tell anybody this, it, it eats a hole in that child. And for fear that something as bad is going to happen if they tell someone else that this has happened to them or they were told this, um, you know, and even as adults, the if, if somebody tells us a secret and say, don't tell anybody, it's, it's not about keeping confidence. It's like, what is wrong that this, you know, if, it, if it's somebody's confidence, then it's keeping somebody's confidence. Yeah. If it's. No, it's usually the secret is that there is going to be harm. There's, it's harmful and, and um, toxic. Yeah. Well, Sandy, maybe this is a good segue here. You, you're talking about um, the secrets and kids. And, and mm -hmm. first, thank you so much for sharing these, you know, traumatic event that you go, had to go through, had you had to endure. But uh, one of the disturbing um trends I've noticed from the show Porn Talk is I've had uh, kids contacting mm -hmm. me that are addicted to porn, a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not have thought that they would be listening to this, this program, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> what do you have to say to these, uh, <laughs> our younger listening audience? stop get help tell your parents ask ask for assistance there is assistance out there that this this addiction and as we i'm sure you've talked about addiction is a habit it's not a disease it is a habit and the average age of, of porn addiction to, to start is between 10 and 12 years old that's the addiction. That means they have watched it for so long already that it is ingrained in a pathway in their brain. And it is a subconscious coping strategy for them when they're feeling stressed or when even just when they're alone. Yeah. And, and it's a go-to because it, it works on the pleasure principle in the brain, the pleasure center of the brain and raises the dopamine level. The only thing with that, that comes shame and guilt. Yes. And that's what stops them from talking to a loved one. I'm doing something bad. I'm doing something. And it doesn't start out. No, no addiction, no habit starts out as I, I'm going to do this all the time. It's, it just happens that that felt good. So I'm going to do it again and I'll do it again and do it again rather than replacing it with something that is growth you know, to, for your own growth and happiness and fostering wellness inside. It, it's fostering toxicity. Yeah. You know, so, so if that is the average age, the average age being 10, then when do most kids start? The, the, according to Fight the New Drug, and I, I would recommend anyone, fightthenewdrug.org, um, the average age is between 7 and 8 years old. Oh. That are the the first viewing. It could be actually age six for first viewing. Um, by the age of 14, 94 percent of teenagers, adolescents, have viewed pornography. 94 percent. So, with parents, you say, "Oh, my child wouldn't do that." My child. It happens accidentally sometimes yeah. sometimes it's just you know kids playing and what if we put in this word what will come up and it's a hook yeah it becomes a hook and in our day and age with technology and smartphones and tablets and 24 7 access 
um, without, you know, net nannies or whatever the, you, you know, need on the devices, it's there and it's accessible. Yeah. And, you know, people may say, well, no, my, my darling child would never view pornography. Okay, let's say that's the case. Well, we know that their friends are going to show it to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it can be accidental. I'll tell you a little story um, about the, you know, my, my granddaughter, like many, you know, at the time when she was five, loved Disney princesses, the palace pets, and so on, and wanted to go on my computer to YouTube because there's videos on Disney princesses. And um, so she could, she could type it. She could spell, she could type, like, so, but I would write with her. And she typed in Disney princesses in Google. And, you know, in the list, what came up, it was like I had to literally remove her from the chat and just say, oh, Paige, just, you know, and to just to get her away. And she's going, what's wrong, Nana? And I said, there's some things on Nana's computer that aren't appropriate. So Nana just has to do some, some work here first, and then you can... Nana will bring up what you can watch and then you can see that. Yeah. And another, mm-hmm. another accidental thing that's starting to come up now I've heard of is Alexa. You know, am yeah. I talking to Alexa? Yes. Well, Alexa doesn't always understand what you say. And uh, there was a video I saw online. Someone just happened to be recording while this kid was talking into Alexa. Alexa did not understand it and brought up, started to spew off this list of porn sites and, and pornographic things. Right. So <laughs> it happens by accident. You're right. It happens by accident. And, you know, you're, it doesn't mean that your, your, you know, your child has done anything wrong. It's come by accident. And then it's like, it's curiosity. Well, what is this? And, you, you know, they click on it and there's all kinds of free access so they click on it, and then it's like, uh, what's that? And then will I be in trouble? So they keep it inside. But then there's a curiosity about what they saw. And so they go back, and they go back, and they go back. And that's what happens. It's creating that pathway in the brain. And pornography, in a very short period of time, does the exact same to the brain as what cocaine does to the brain. Man. And so we, we have to realize that if we wouldn't leave cocaine lying around for our children to accidentally access, we really need to be safe with our electronics. And that includes our television, because now with a lot of the smart TVs, they can access wow. YouTube, they can access all kinds of things. So unless we have these blocked on and every single device, and model the behavior that we wish to see in our children, you know, our children are going to have access. And if not at your house, at their friend's house, that may not have these blocks on. Sandy, you said model the behavior that we would like to see our children have. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I go out to dinner and there'll be a family sitting at the table and they literally are all on their phones. There's a a family of five, the mother's mm-hmm. on the phone, the father's on the phone, the three kids are all on the phone. Yes. Um, I would presume that these the kids at the table are on their phones because their parents are always on the phones. What, what do you have to say about all that? Absolutely. It's about moderation. It's not about not having the phones. It's about moderation. And, and sadly, what's happening as our our adolescents, our children are turning into adolescents and teenagers, is that they're losing not only the, um, the ability for communication, but how to communicate, how to interact with other people. And the more isolated they become, the more they go to the internet, you know, for their entertainment. And the more they go to the internet, the more porn is available. And it is, I can't state enough how damaging and how toxic and how far reaching it is. Yeah. I don't know how much truth there is this story. Someone told me that now a lot of teenagers are choosing not to drive because they rather interact through uh, social media. Boy, I, I remember when 
I was 15. I was chomping at the bit. The di- literally the day that I turned 16, I got my driver's mm-hmm. license. Mm-hmm. And it, it pains me to think that, oh my gosh, I mean, these kids would rather stay online rather than to actually go out and see their friends. It, yes. it, it's, it's mind blowing. Social anxiety is growing and growing and growing higher and higher. And why is it growing? It's because of technology. It's be, and, and technology can be a wonderful, wonderful thing. I, I'm, I'm not downplaying the, the wonderful uses of technology. Yes. But it can also be damaging. And that's where we need parents to moderate, you know, and manage how, how much screen time. You know, children are having issues with sleeping because they're, they're you know, it's the screen time. Yeah. It's, but they're losing the ability to know how to interact as 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 people they are losing the ability to know how to play they're losing the ability and you know to to just have human interaction and communication um and it's through text you know yes. they're texting rather than calling mm-hmm. or they're they're choosing to, to stay and do the video game thing or you know um absolutely yeah. And Sandy, I know you've worked with children at the Simcoe County Children Aid, Children's Aid Society, mm-hmm. and you also um, are, spe- your, one of your specialties is uh, working with victims of trauma. Mm-hmm. How is, is porn a, a form of trauma for kids, early exposure? Absolutely. It is, it is stunting their developmental growth. It is, um, what happens is, the pleasure center of the brain becomes larger and the executive center then becomes smaller. So the executive center is where we have our logical reasoning, our decision making, our ability to learn. And so as, as that becomes smaller and the pleasure center becomes bigger, you know, the children are struggling in school with academics. They're struggling in other areas of their life, which is it's all traumatic because now there's more bullying. There's, there's just more issues, but the trauma of it is porn, whether some people agree with this or not, there is so much research. Porn is violence against women. Porn, when we're watching porn, we're watching a woman being raped. End of story. That's exactly, or women being raped or gang raped. That's what we're watching. And you know, that is traumatic. Right. And what's happening, especially, and this is sad, there is more research coming out, and there was just a study from, I can't recall the exact hospital in California, where there was young girls, ages four to eight, they were seeing over and over these young girls coming in being sexually abused, oh sexually God. assaulted. And the perpetrators were young boys ages eight to 15. Oh my gosh. So it's, 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 you know, the, it, it's just spiraling. It's spiraling. And where, where is the cause from watching it in pornography? So watching porn, the boys go to enact it. Yeah. And, yeah. And so they enact it in smaller and younger girls. And these girls are being sexually molested by other children. So children upon children, abuse, sexual abuse, is increasing exponentially. Man. Sandy, we're talking about a lot lot of the challenges and problems and issues that Mm -hmm. Porter's brought brought up. How can we um, heal? How can, like, for these trauma victims that you work with, what Mm -hmm. what are some of the tools, what are some of the things that you teach to help them uh, move forward? The, for the, the ones who are, have been abused, and I'm gonna liken <laughs> that pornography is abusing these young men. Okay. Well, I agree, uh, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an example. Uh, I uh, um, stumbled on pornography at a young age. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, I'm an example. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's, you know. Yeah. It, it, the, the, the Hugh Hefners, the Ron Jeremy's, the, you know, the, the ones that have made, and, and now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. 
and it's money driven and it's 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 just a huge industry and yet it's destroying our our society and it's destroying it's increasing violence against women violence against children so how do i help to answer your question for for children depending on their age it, it is through play therapy but it's to let them know they did nothing wrong they did nothing wrong to be on the receiving end of this violence so like can you give an example of play therapy okay so um for example you're literally as a as a play therapist you're sitting you're sitting on the floor playing with all kinds of different toys and at first you that the child needs to be able to trust you that you're safe okay and once you that happens the child will start reenacting through play what has happened to them because sometimes a child cannot voice what it was that was done or what what they felt like but they reenact it with plastic animals or plastic you know people Dogs, and yeah. it's in that reenacting that you're able to to ascertain you know what the child has gone through without asking questions we cannot ask probing questions did this happen to you or something like did this happen to you it's it's not about it's what the child is reenacting is what you know happened to them so then you are are letting them know that they didn't deserve it it is not their fault um that they will be okay they 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 will get you know better and it's about giving them opportunity to have a voice work it out through art through you know drawings through coloring through screaming through my ultimate ultimate is to have my own clinic where i have a rage room because and that's for children and adults because anger is a secondary emotion that actually covers when we're feeling powerless, vulnerable, fear and sadness. And when we when we're not safe to feel sad or safe to be vulnerable, anger is that defense mechanism. It's the fight and fight or flight. It's the fight that tries to make us feel powerful. And and it's it's not wrong to have that emotion. What is wrong is when we take it out on other people in an abusive way, whether that's verbally, whether that's physically, um whether that's emotionally but it's okay to express it rather than hold on to it because it's covering it's the defense mechanism in a rage room it's a place where you can go in and smash things <laughs> in a safe environment right other things that i allow kids to do is pick up a pillow and just scream at the top of their lungs punch a punching bag yeah you know to be able to get these you know how dare someone do this to me and be able to get that that anger out is is actually very healing and healthy yeah i have uh my 4 year old year old son in uh, little dragons martial arts and uh i'm a martial artist as well and i can definitely speak to the benefits of uh hitting an object it is it is very liberating and and so that that brings me to the next question. So we were talking about kids. What would you suggest to adults that are have experienced some type of either sexual trauma or just are not just but are addicted to pornography? Uh, what you know, a lot of our listeners right now, of course, are mm -hmm. older men that are or younger men. But I'm directing this to the older men. What would you say to the older men that are addicted to porn or or that have so, some form of trauma that they're overcoming. So, the first and foremost is reach out for help. If you think you can stop this on your own, the likelihood is you will not be able to. Can some people? Absolutely. I'm not going to paint everyone with the same brush because absolutely there are some people, but it's very very rare and that goes for most addictions. It's very rare that someone can just go cold turkey, never see it again. And the reason is, especially for porn and, and sex addiction, is because sex is a part of our daily life. Sex is in every, you know, almost every TV show you see, every movie you watch, every, you know, magazine you look at. There is something that is sexualized, and our society is highly sexualized. The yeah. other, it is an innate, um, innate 
part of us that we are sexual beings as human beings. And it is very hard when someone has a porn and sex addiction to rein back and to have an intimate relationship because that's one of the things that porn does. It destroys intimacy, completely and utterly destroys intimacy. So someone is watching porn, there's no vulnerability, there's no emotion, you don't have to be open. It's pure fantasy, purely raising the, you know, increasing the dopamine and increasing the pleasure center of the brain. Whereas an intimate relationship, there has to be a true intimate relationship. There has to be vulnerability, emotion, and the person has to be open. But it's not as exciting. Doesn't mean the dopamine can't rise and oxytocin can't rise um, in an intimate, you know, true intimate loving relationship. It's a different feeling. It's a different feeling than the, the spike in dopamine. And it's still oxytocin. It's still, it's still there and, and, um, and helping. Um, so what do you do? Reach out to someone, or to professionals who know. And I'm going to do a plug for the mindful habit system because in my 20 plus years of anything working in this field as, as a clinical traumatologist, as a registered psychotherapist, in my, in my experience, professionally and personally, and believe me, after I found out almost three years ago, my go-to is research, 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 research. What can I read? And I've read, I can't, oh, so much. But that's for my, my own self to understand. So what I found was that things like 12 steps, can it help some people? Absolutely. And again, I'm not going to say it, it can't. For porn and sex addiction, it doesn't have, it has a very small uh, efficacy rate. And in fact, even for alcoholics, it is an 8 to 22% efficacy rate. Yeah. That's well, very low. Well, I can personally, for those that have been listening to the show know, uh, I was in 12-step programs for about 20 years with very little success. Right. And then I found the mindful habit system, yeah. which uh, both Sandy and I are certified coaches under the mindful habit system. That's how we know each other. Yes. Um, and I can personally vouch that it, it works. It works. It didn't, it doesn't happen overnight and it, it requires a lot of work, but uh, the science of mindfulness for me has worked wonders. Right. And, and, and it does. And I use the mindful habit system, you know, the three A's. I use this system with almost all of my clients because the compulsive behavior is, is an addiction itself. But compulsive behavior, anxiety is a thought addiction. OCD is a thought addiction. Perfectionism is a thought addiction. Anger is a feeling addiction. Guilt is a feeling addiction. So you, there's, there's all kinds of addictions in, and they're all compulsive behaviors, including the thought process. So the three A's of the mindful habit system, the awareness, the accountability, and the action, works in so many ways, including working with trauma and the compulsive thoughts, the, the loop of thought that something is wrong with me or I caused that to happen. And so that's in the coping component, in the relaxation techniques, in the coping before you do any trauma processing, I am working on safety and coping and relaxation techniques with my client. And this is the mindful habit comes in all the time. Many people believe that being mindful is sitting with meditation. And I can tell you that is not it. If meditation can be a part of it, absolutely. But it is not to the end. For myself, I have a difficult time meditating. Mm -hmm. I'm a mover. So dancing. But it's being med mindful is being in the here and now. Being mm -hmm. cognizant of, of what's happening in your body. The feelings, the stress, whatever's happening. And what do you do about it? That's being mindful. Yeah. And, and making mindful choices that nurture and nourish yourself. And in doing so, you're nurturing and nourishing your relationships, your family, your, your work, all of that. When you nurture and nourish self, you're nurturing and nourish everything around you. It's the ripple effect. That's what mindful is, mindfulness based, you know, right. is. Right. And, uh, you know, like I was talking about martial arts, that's, mm -hmm. that's a form of mindfulness. Yoga. 
you know, absolutely yoga. But, you know, but for some people, it's playing volleyball. Mm -hmm. It's being in the here and now, just focusing on that ball coming across the net. It's something that brings them pleasure. They feel productive. They feel exhilarated. You know, going for a run, a walk, walking your dog, petting your dog. It, it's those kinds of things that are mindful. And it's what brings you pleasure. Those that it's self care. You know, what brings you pleasure? Baking for me. I love to bake. Mm -hmm. It's something I do for me. I don't have a sweet tooth. My neighbors love me. <laughs> but it's, it's just, I love to bake. And it is just a, for me, everything and all the stress just goes when I'm working with that. I don't like to cook so much, <laughs> but I like to bake. Sandy, this show, it, as you know, it's not just about breaking addictions. It's about breaking belief systems. Yes. What belief or paradigm needs to change around porn or, or what paradigm needs to change for uh, men around porn or kids around porn? The first thing I'll come to is that it's normal. It's not normal. Yeah. All men don't watch porn. Yeah. It's not a rite of passage for adolescents. Yes. It's not normal. It's toxic. And when you say it's normal, if you're saying it's normal to, to have your adolescents take cocaine, because it's doing the exact yes. same thing to the brain. If it's you're normal for your partner to watch porn, you're telling yourself that it's normal for your partner to have cocaine, because it's doing the same thing to the brain. I and love I what you're saying. Right? I don't think as a society... We agree that have you know taking cocaine is normal or okay. Yeah. Pornography you know, is just as toxic. Yes, yes, it is. The normalizing. I, I love what you're you're saying because uh, uh, you can't see them right now. I have a little. Um, <laughs> we made up a little mascot for the show, and he's he's a little wiener guy, and. It's and to make fun, but it, it's got a serious connotation to it. it it's the, the the little man. He's got a smartphone. He's got a big red eye, and he's he's obsessively looking at this smartphone with pornography on it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the I'm, I coined a term. I, I I called it the pornification of the world. Yes, that the porn is just a normal thing that everyone mm -hmm. uses. And you know, every it's got it's on your smartphone. Mm -hmm. It's just a normal thing. Oh, you know, he he's viewing that kid viewed porn. You know, big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, you know, when I was a kid, if we got a hold of say like a Playboy magazine, like right. oh my gosh, I mean, we really thought we had something. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. the magazines completely they don't even produce the magazine anymore because there's so much hardcore porn online. And, and that's the thing. So just like, I, I'm going to use the example because people understand more, if you will, alcoholism. A person who develops alcoholism doesn't start out to be an alcoholic. They start out and have a drink or two. And you know what? That kind of numb them out, make them feel a little chipper. You know, they feel a little bit better. And so the next time, you know, they, they have another couple. And, that, and then pretty soon, a couple doesn't do a damn thing. And they have to have three or four. And after that, five or six, and then seven or eight, and then they have to have it every day or binge on the weekends because that's still an alcoholic. They don't start out choosing to have the addiction. Someone who's watching porn thinks, oh, I'm watching this. And they usually start with a softer, if you can call it soft porn. It's all abuse and it's all weight. And I will stand by that 100%. 97% um, of people, women in porn are human traffic. It just, just. Okay, so I'll go off on a tangent there. It doesn't start off to, to be, but all of a sudden, it, it's, it's not enough. It's not, okay, I've seen that. Like, that's not doing anything for me. It's not raising the dopamine, although we don't know that it's the dopamine. It's just not doing, it's not giving me anything. Mm -hmm. So you watch harder stuff mm -hmm. and more often. And then that's not doing it. So then you need to go to harder stuff and harder stuff. And I want to put this out there because there's a huge denial. And there's two things, points I want to, want to do, okay? If that's okay. Sure. One is that men who are watching porn 
don't believe they're watching child porn. I'm going to ask, how do you know? Because the female could be 13 years old and make up and haired to look like she's 18 or 19 or 20 or 22. Children are developing earlier and earlier. There's girls that are having their period by eight years old and developing breasts. So by 10 or 11, they may look like they're 16. So by 13, they may look like they're 18 or 19 or 20. And so you're thinking you're watching a young woman, but you may actually be watching a child and you don't know it. So any watching of porn could actually be child porn. I, and, I understand. Well, I, I love I love what you said awesome. about the paradigm that needs to change about mm -hmm. the, the normalization of the view of porn. So may, may but, I add one more thing? Yeah, Mark? go ahead, please. It's just the statistic of adolescent uh, okay, the, the highest raising population of erectile dysfunction in men. We tend to think it's in 50, 60, 70 year old men, you know, age, medical. It's not. The highest raising population of erectile dysfunction is in 18 to 25 year old males. And it's because of pornography. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, re I've read that, that uh, the, the largest segment that is uh, requesting the little blue pill um, for erectile dysfunction is the 18 to 25 year olds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's because of pornography. Yeah. And it can and, be reversed with stopping the use. Yeah, and I actually know uh, a young man um, that does have that problem for that reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a, somebody I uh, somebody I know. Mm -hmm. It's sad. Well, Sandy, we are talking about all these uh, huge huge issues here. One of the things on the program we like to talk about is, you know, how to create a great life. We don't want to just overcome an addiction to porn or just overcome uh, an addiction to compulsive sex. We want to create a great life. What, what is something that you share with your clients on not just overcoming the addiction, but on creating a great life? How, how can we create a great life? It's in the addiction, any addiction, you tend to, there tends to be, um, I think, well, I deserve this. I deserve this. I, you know, no, it's not going to hurt anybody. And so what I like, what I work with with my clients is what really do you deserve? Do you deserve something that's toxic that is, ends up being harmful and harmful to your relationship? Or do you deserve to have something that is, that grows you, empowers you, gives you power, true power that you feel so good about and that you can share with the world? And that starts with self-care. There, there are four basic human needs, you know, other than food and shelter. And that's to be loved, to be accepted, to be wanted, and to be respected. And in those four, it, it comes with self-respect, self-acceptance, to want self and to have self-love. And to, to have those things, it, it has to start from within. And that's self-care. So what does self-care look like? Well, really, it's different for, you know, anyone so like i said like somebody playing volleyball or you doing your your martial arts you know for somebody else it's soaking in a in a, a a bubble bath with a glass of wine for me it's baking i love bubble baths too but mm -hmm. it's it's whatever the self-care and there could be multiple things so that's the first thing is to work on the belief that you deserve to take care of yourself and to carve out time every single day for yourself even if it's 15 minutes mm -hmm. and as as parents we tend to put our children first and I'm not saying you don't do that but as long as you're carving out some time for you too, to go for a walk a run go to the gym play that sport you know read that book you just relax with music whatever that looks like it will grow you and it will foster healing in you and you deserve it Every person deserves it. Yeah, yes, I do. Yes, yes, we do. That was the hardest thing for me, you know, 
from viewing porn so early, I didn't like myself. Yeah. So for, for, you know, for years I would uh, do this affirmation. I would say to myself in the mirror, I like myself, or I couldn't even say that. I'd say I'm, I'm learning to like myself. Mm -hmm. Finally, one day I, I teared up because I looked at myself in the mirror and I actually liked myself. It was a fantastic, it was a fantastic day. Um, so yes, you, you got to learn to love yourself. Right. So, and that's exactly it. So we're going to get you from liking yourself to loving yourself, Eric. And that's to be able to look in the mirror, look yourself in the eye and be truthful and say, you know, I love you. And mean it. And that it wasn't hard to say that. And it's not in a narcissistic way or a self-centered way, conceited way, you know, sociopathic way. It's, it's to say, you know, you deserve good things. You deserve to be healthy and happy and, and have those things around you, but mostly for inside of you. Because it's really not the things that are on the external other than our, you know, family and friends. It's, it's what we believe. What fills you up? What fills you? What fills your soul? Yes. And you want to fill your soul with cleansing, healthy, happy things rather than things that are going to break you right. and are toxic and you away at you. Right. Well, Sandy, thank you so much for being on the show how can listeners get a hold of you? Or my my website is uh, simple. It's sandrajoy.ca. You can see my website, and then my email and stuff is there. Or sandy at sandrajoy.ca is my email. Um, I, I would also ask the and please feel free to to reach out. Um, and I really do uh, help many partners or ex-partners of people with porn and sex addiction, and that mm -hmm. is the, the trauma, betrayal trauma, and, and stuff that comes with that, mm -hmm. um, but on their own work and their their power. Um, but I ask you to reach out to the Mindful Habit System, you know, Powerful Eric as a coach, for help, because it's working. It is working so tremendously well. So many people are being helped, and it's, it's phenomenal. The other is I'd like, especially for parents, well, it, anybody, to research fightthenewdrug.org. There is so much information on there, researched, reliable, you know, um, experiential knowledge, you know, information. And, uh, and that's including, there's a part about how to, how to talk to your children about pornography. You know, especially if your child comes to you, but how do you open up the discussion? And it's important, you know, I remember, when, like, and maybe you too, Eric, like, our parents never talked to us about sex. That was taboo. We didn't really learn that from your friends or, you know, a little bit in school. But you really learned it by yourself. Right. Well, now parents, more parents are talking to their children about sex. And, and then they're learning more in sex education in school. But it's still not enough. We need to talk about this, this toxicity that is literally eating our society away from the inside out. It is. Yes. And we need to, and it's growing in secrecy. We need to be the voice, to, to be the voice. And I'm praying that in my lifetime, the porn industry is shut down. If not mine, at least my children's lifetime. Right. But money talks, right? So I'm not, I'm trying to be hopeful. And I'll continue to be hopeful. And that's all I can do is I will not have this in secrecy. Right. Well, Sandy, thanks again for being on the show. Uh, if you connected with Sandy, be sure to reach out to her. Uh, thanks for listening. And I'll close with this quote from Zig Ziglar, who says, you are designed for accomplishment. You are engineered for success. And you are endowed with the seeds of greatness. Stay. Yeah. Powerful, friends. Stay powerful.
Thanks for listening. If you're struggling with porn or sex addiction, then contact Eric at PowerfulEric.com. Remember, you are powerful.